Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to continue our review of The World Upside Down by the Pillars of Truth Church. This is a documentary or an explanation of the position of the Young Earth Creationists. Now, the Young Earth Creationists believe in the story of the creation of the Earth as told in the Bible in Genesis. They believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. We've discussed that in our last episode. Today, we're going to have a look at the dome above the Earth called the firmament. We'll have a look and see what they claim. We'll compare it to reality and see where their logic takes us. So let's cue up the music and get going. We are told by the world today that the Earth is a sphere. This sphere is commonly referred to as the globe. This lesson is taught in nearly every classroom all across the world. But let's take a closer look at the creation story to see if this truly is what God created. Now, once again, he's starting off with a premise that we are told the Earth is a globe. We are told without evidence that the earth is a globe is the premise here. When his book tells us that the earth is not a globe, we should accept that. But when science tells us the earth is a globe because it's a planet, we should not accept that. So I I have a little trouble trying to figure out this logic that he's starting off with. But this is his chicken, so let's let him cook it. Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2 say, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So in the beginning, the earth was purely water. Now the question we need to ask ourselves is this. Is this body of water in the shape of a sphere, or is it resting flat? Think back to any time you've seen a body of water in your life. It could have been a small body of water such as a glass or a puddle, or it could have been a larger body of water, such as a lake or an ocean. Whenever you witness these bodies of water, did you ever notice the surface of the water curve? Of course not. The surface of the water, no matter how large or small, always rested flat. You know, this is something that always gets me about these flat earth proponents. They always like to point to the horizon on the ocean and show that it's somehow flat. And they seem to expect that we would see this on a curved Earth. The problem that you run into is that the Earth itself is some 8,000 miles in diameter. And the amount of that arc of the curve of the horizon that we can see side to side from a low level on the water is minuscule. We would have to see 69 miles of uninterrupted horizon to see a one degree curve in the horizon. Now the strange thing about it is that we can indeed see a side to side curve looking out on the horizon over the ocean simply by compressing the image from side to side. The curve will start to come out and be accentuated. But there's another way that we can see the curve and this is something that always confuses me about people that believe in the flat earth. And that is that a sphere curves from side to side. It also curves from front to back. So even though we don't see images that curve like this, we most definitely see images that curve front to back. So for example, we have a ship here in the foreground, and then we have a container ship in the background. Where's the hull of the ship? The hull of the ship is below the curve. There are numerous examples of this. Why is it that when you talk about a curve on the surface of a sphere, the people in the flat earth only want to talk about it in one direction? They don't want to talk about it in the other direction. The reason being is that it's very easy to see in the other direction and very difficult to see side to side. This is because bodies of water always seek to reach and maintain their level. This is important to understand because the earth was originally completely water. With the understanding that bodies of water do not curve, this rules out the possibility 
of this being a spherical body of water. Well, here's another problem that they run into. In the book of Genesis, it says, God said, let there be light. He didn't say, let there be light and gravity. So what happens when you have water in an environment that has no gravity? Well, it forms a sphere. The other thing that really bothers me about the flat earth and young earth creationism is the misuse of phrases and idiom. The phrase, water always seeks its level, has nothing to do with fluids. It's more akin to the saying, birds of a feather flock together. Water seeks its own level is a way of describing society and the tendency of people to associate with people that are like themselves. You see, when you put water in a glass, what happens is all that water seeks to find its level of lowest potential energy. That means that the surface of the water will be perpendicular to the radius of the earth, which is the line of gravity. You know, I think it's kind of important to toss this out there. There's a difference between straight and level. For example, this level is straight, but it's not level. You'd have to bring the you have to bring the bubble into the middle to make it level. The other thing that's important to talk about is when we discuss the term sea level, it has to do with the distance of that spot of water to the center of the earth. And because the earth is a sphere, the surface of that water, that ocean, can curve and still be the same distance to the center of the earth, so it's all still level but it is not flat. In order to create a place within this water for mankind to live, God had to create a space for open air. Genesis 1, verses 6 and 7 say, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. So what God did was God created the firmament, a large, solid structure similar to a dome that separated the water that was above it from the water that was below it. We can tell that the firmament is a solid structure because it is supporting the waters which are above it. Neither a gas nor a liquid could do that. You know, you might have a point there. Where in nature could we find gas? separating water above it from water below it. I'm stumped. Genesis 1, verses 9 and 10 say, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Here, we see the body of water underneath the firmament being gathered together into seas, giving space for the dry land to appear. Okay, now those of you that are following along probably picked up on the fact that according to this account, the water is gathered together, allowing the dry land to appear. Now, here's the problem that you run into. Let's assume that the proto-Earth here was a water-covered object, and under the water was land. Now, if we gather water together to allow the land to appear, that water will have to heap up because you have a certain volume of water and you've reduced the area it covers. It must go up. That means that by definition, the land has to be below the surface of the water. Now, with an exception, say, like the Netherlands, we can see that happening. But in general, the land is above the level of the water. So the only way that this can occur is if the land was higher than the water in the first place, or the water level dropped to the point the land became higher than the surface of the water. Where did the water go? Genesis 1 verse 8 says, And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Here, we learn that another name for the firmament is heaven. This is because the Bible uses the word heaven to describe three separate things. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, 
whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. This verse tells us that there are three separate heavens in the Bible. The first heaven is the sky, the place in which birds fly. An example of the Bible using the word heaven to refer to the sky is Revelation 19 verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. We know that this verse is referring to the sky, because that's the only height birds can reach. You know, you really can't beat that logic. It's pretty solid. Birds do fly in the atmosphere, in the sky. Genesis refers to the first heaven as the sky or the place where the birds fly. I can go with that. In addition, the word heaven in the Bible can refer to the place where God currently resides, above the firmament. This is what the Bible calls the third heaven. An example of the Bible using the word heaven in this way is Matthew 5, verse 16. The Bible says, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Okay, I think we're starting to break down a little bit here. You say that God lives in the third heaven, yet this verse simply uses the term heaven. How do you know that God doesn't live in the first heaven with the birds in the sky? And what's in the third heaven? Could this cause a problem for other parts of the Bible? Let's follow along and see what he has to say. And lastly, the word heaven can refer to the firmament itself the solid dome which encapsulates the world we live in today. This is what the Bible calls the second heaven. The reader has to be able to distinguish from the context which heaven the Bible is referring to. Okay, so let me see if I can get this straight. The birds live in the sky, which is the first heaven. God lives in third heaven, and the two are separated by second heaven, which is the dome. But didn't just a moment ago you say the purpose of the firmament or the dome or second heaven as you're referring it to now is to separate the waters above from the waters below? Wouldn't the third heaven be full of water? Is God a fish? And if God created us in his own image, would we not have gills? Because God lives in water, would we not live in the water? These are inconsistencies that you just haven't thought through, I think. Well, then again, maybe this is not that much of a problem. Life began in the seas, they tell us, and we had gills. That would work. But then how did we come to become land animals without gills? Maybe we evolved. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. I'm going to leave you with one last thought. Here is a series of embryos. Would you please tell me which one is human? <laughs>